Yo, Pierre, you want to come out here? <laughs>
And I remember calling her and just like, Ma uh, mom, I found an internship. She was really thrilled I found an internship because uh, the way I found about the job, it was like a last minute application for me. It was March. So it was two months before, summer before I worked at Blaze Pizza, minimum wage. Exactly. I just grinded, uh, made what, like 10K in a summer minimum wage. And my mom's like, Max, you have to find an internship. I'm like, cool. You're right. I do. Mm -hmm. And so I spam applied, found this job, was fortunate enough to, to get it. And you know, I called her and I'm like, mom, like I got an internship. Only thing is it's 100% commission based. And she's like, oh, okay, Max. Yeah, so you got a fake job or whatever, right? And then, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you know what, mom? I'm going to try it out. I'm going to, they're giving me free living. Like I'll give it a go. Yeah. Um, I mean, the rest is history, right? Like where you are now. So yeah, sorry to jump. Yeah. Um, yeah, my parents were too hyped about it. My dad was a little bit more for it. He would actually push me back in the day to go and sell uh, like grass cutting or shoveling driveways and stuff. They just like start knocking on people's doors. So he was a little bit more open to it, but uh, yeah, definitely a tough sell. Okay. And so since then, so tell us um, about how you guys have moved up throughout the organization and we'll, we'll cover this stuff really quick and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes of, you know, some tips and tricks to sell. Right. But, you know, tell us how far you guys have come. Let's start with juice. Yeah. Well, I think like me and Max have a pretty similar, uh, I guess like upbringing in the sense of like the growth within Vantage. We were both rookies last year mm -hmm. in the Burlington office. Um, and so this year we're both, you know, came back as managers. So I think um, it's just one of those things, like if you see a rookie who goes from his first year and then managing second year, I think that's just a testament to the amount of growth that you can really have within this company. Um, but really just shows like the, the trust and the, I guess like the, you know, confidence that managers and partners and, and the owners have and you know the people who work for the company um but yeah not not much to say honestly just coming back as a second year manager i think is pretty cool um, i don't know if you have anything to say yeah no i mean it, it was unique right so when me and juice were were rookies it was a unique time right so we had kevin mateo and tess they're all partners here at the company is they didn't take a step down but they were actively managing teams so, and then they stepped up Right into more, you know, administrative, not administrative positions, but they were helping with solar. They were, you know, growing the company. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was openings for management for the pest control teams. And so, yeah, we literally joined it at the perfect time. It's very rare. I'm, I'm sure you can speak on this as well, Mateo. Um, Jack, you as well, right? It's like management's in second year. It happens and it's, you know, for that top performers. Uh, but, you know, like assistant managing and managing a solo team, like that's super rare. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, with my experience, I was supposed to co-manage a team with Patty. That was the plan originally. Mm -hmm. uh, Patty was one of my roommates here with, with Juice last year. Uh, we were the top three guys in the Burlington team. But, uh, yeah, no, it just so happened that it uh, didn't work out there. And I ended up taking the team solo. And, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't be more thrilled, right? It's an opportunity where 21 years old, Juice, how old are you? I'm 20. There you go. Like, so talk about like, yeah. so how many people do you guys oversee? How much revenue are we talking about that's passing through these teams? Yeah, so right now the team is 15 others. So I have Angus, shout out Angus, experienced rep, absolutely love you. Um, and then I have 14 rookies. So we started at the beginning of the season with uh, 17 rookies and Angus, and then now we're down to 14, which is fantastic um, mm -hmm. for the turnover. And yeah, so size 15 right now is a team we're on just over 400K revenue. Um, Kitchener team, if you're listening to this, we got to step that up. Um, it's not enough for my liking, but yeah, 400K revenue, uh, 14 people. Yes, sir. And you too. Yeah. And then for us, well, like Jack and I are managing here in the headquarters in Burlington. Um, so we have a pretty good setup. I've, I've said in the Vantage Weekly, but I'm super grateful for Jack here. Um, just co-managing with him, being able to split responsibilities. Uh, we just crossed, what, $800,000 in revenue. So oh, right around there, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like one thing I wanted to say is like, especially for me um, coming in as like an assistant manager, Max had a great rookie year. I didn't have as good of a rookie year. And I think like it was kind of a gamble to, you know, give a guy like me who's young and was a pretty good rookie, but not like a great rookie, at, you know, an opportunity to be in a leadership position. And for me, like that was just fuel. I was like, okay, if I'm going to go into a leadership position and, you know, get an upgrade in terms of responsibility and leadership, I gotta make the most of it. Um, and I almost saw like the assistant manager is like, I'm looking at my roommate, Max, who's, you know, he's a manager, he's managing solo. It's almost like a bigger role than I have. And I'm like, okay, like they're, they're kind of, uh, I kind of felt like an underdog, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, like they're, you know, they're undermining my, my capabilities, my potential. So I really wanted to come out this year and just like show everyone like what I'm capable of doing. Um, so I think it just goes to show like, you know, if you come back as a second year manager, even just any leadership, responsibilities it like you, you got to take the chance and really make the most out of it 
Um, and I feel like that's kind of what I'm doing. I think it's, it's something you just got to do, especially if you're going to move up in the position, like you just got to go out and capitalize on the opportunity. Yeah. The underdog story really lights a fire under you. Right? For sure. The tenacity to come out and put up the accounts this guy did in the first uh, week is, is pretty killer. And yourself? It's nuts. Yeah. Like just to speak on that, like, so I'm in my fourth year here now. So I've, you know, I've been around a bit and I, you know, I got the, the privilege of getting to see these two guys in their rookie year, seeing where they were at and having firsthand witnessed that growth, which is really just, you know, to, to see a guy who comes out, doesn't eclipse 80 sales in a whole summer. And then that same guy to come out and be third in the country, fourth in the country, uh, and doing that at a point where you guys are pretty much almost at your totals from last summer and post half that thing, you're yeah, past yeah. it. I think I crossed my total in uh, the second week this year. <laughs> well, I, it's, it's crazy. crazy. God. And it's, it's literally why this job is one of those ones where it just feels like such a waste to come out and give it the shot mm -hmm. for only one summer. Mm -hmm. Because it's just when you come out and you come up for a second summer, that initial learning curve with this job. Because the first month of this job, anyone who's done it will tell you, is tough. It's yeah. really tough. Probably the toughest thing you'll ever do. Uh, and most people suck when they start. I know I did. I sucked real bad when I started. Uh, but then when you're able to come back, have that experience, have those expectations, know what you're getting into, and take the necessary steps to prepare for that and do it like you know Max and Juice here have done. And to see that growth where they're more than doubling their accounts and less than half that time is crazy. Yeah. So yeah, from my point of view, uh, a little bit of a different story. I've been here for four years now. So same deal, came out in my rookie year, didn't know what I was getting into, just said, screw it, let's sling some bug spray and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, it was a grind that summer. I started pretty slow. I don't think I was in the top 20 rookies after the first month, uh, but I was just super competitive, grinded it out, was uh, you know, competing with other guys like Noah Vague, Ray Matthews, other dogs in this company who y'all know. Uh, managed the battle out and get top rookie that year. And ever since then, I was just... It's like this job really just kind of had a full paradigm shift for me, kind of in terms of what I realized I was capable of doing, what I wanted to do. Because I was raised by teachers, love them to death. My parents, some of the smartest, hardest working people I know, uh, but not very entrepreneurial, I'd say. And it was cool, kind of. I always thought I would just go to school, go to law school, work 60, 70 hours a week as a lawyer until I retired at 50 and then finally started living. Yeah. Uh, but it's cool. Like after doing this job, you just realize. You're an individual who gets dropped off in a neighborhood with nothing but a binder, an idea, and your ability to communicate and connect with people. And through that ability alone, you're able to generate thousands of dollars in revenue, as well as thousands of dollars in personal income through just your ability to talk to people and help them. Yeah, it's pretty cool to think that like you just like kidnap one of you guys, like you know, bag over your head, take you into a van, and then just drop you off in any English speaking area. We'll make money in the world. And it's like let's start a message real quick. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But no, I just wanted to say like on what Jack was saying there, because uh, same as Jack, like I'm currently studying in a science program, kinesiology, and I always looked back and I was like, man, I wish I did some sort of business or like economics, finance. Whatever it is, I always look back and wish I did something like that. And that's part of the reason that I took this job is because I was like, okay, like, I feel like this is my shot to really get into that world um, and to, you know, get my foot in the door and try something that's related to like sales, business, something like that. Um, and that's why I would encourage like anyone who's, whether you're in a science program or in a business program, if you want to get into like sales or business, like this is just such a good entry point because it's, it's like low ticket. It's like no... There's no risk to it. It's not like you're investing thousands of dollars into like a new business that might, you know, fall apart. It's like you're going out, you're seeing what you can do. Um, you know, you're trying out sales and I think it's a good spot to start for sales, mm -hmm. um, especially with what we do with pest control. Um, but I wanted to go back to what you were saying about like coming back for second year. And I think a lot of rookies and myself included um, going into the first summer, you know, you, you have your interviews and you look at like the commission pay scale, stuff like that. And you're like, oh, okay, like, I know I'm, I'm better than everyone else. Like, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to sell like, you know, 200, 300 accounts. I'm going to break the rookie record. I'm sure like hundreds of rookies every year. They're like, oh, what's the record? L let me go. Out. I'm going to go and beat that. Right. Um, and I think everyone goes in with that. But, you know, throughout the summer and after your first summer, it kind of gives you the frame of reference and you kind of get to see like what other people are able to achieve. So you look at guys like Jack, you look at, you know, some of the top performers, you're like, okay, if, if these guys are able to, you know, achieve it. And as great as Jack is, he's a human just like myself, just like Mags. You know, if people who are, you know, similar to me are able to do this, it gives you like an idea of like, okay, what's what's possible in, in you know, door to door and doing something like this? And then what's possible for me? So then it gives you like a frame of reference. Okay, 
now I know what I'm able to do. And then you come back for your second year and you're able to achieve things that you probably would have never imagined. Such as like my example, like for, like for myself, like I never would have thought that I would make this much money in a summer. Uh, I never even imagined myself in sales, but you know, you have your first summer and in my rookie year, I was like, okay, like I'm going to be the top rookie. I was trying to be rookie of the year. I was like, what, Sam, what's your record? Okay, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be your record. Right. Um, and then you might not like meet your expectations in the first year, but then the second year you can be like, okay, um, now I know like what I'm able to do. And you're obviously going to do a lot better in your second year. I think for any rookie right now who's watching this, if you're coming back for your second year, um, it should be minimum like double your production. And I think even that, like you should be shooting for higher than that. Um, but even if you think about it, like if you double your production your second year, that's so much growth and it's so much more money and experience and skill and like, you know, things that you've learned um, just on top of just your rookie year. So I think just going into first year, just the, the one year is just scraping the surface of like the experience and the skills that you learn from mm -hmm. yeah. doing door to door. So I'd really recommend to anyone um, to come back for a second year if you're in your first year. Um, it's, I, I think it's worth it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So let's shift gears here and let's talk about some meat and potatoes about sales. All right. So we have this idea of the caricature, the textbook salesperson, right? The used car salesman, what have you, right? Yeah. All right. Someone who people start interacting with them and they're like, oh no, how long am I going to be stuck here for? You know, what's this person going to push on me? Right. Um, and, and so what's the opposite of that? What, what do we want to be when we're out there and we're having conversations with people? Yeah. And I like, this might sound kind of cheesy, but like yourself, you know, and what I mean by that is if you're really trying super hard to like play someone, play a character, be someone else, really just trying to sell, uh, then you're just going to be a sleazy salesman, you know, but if you're going out there and you're just, you know, having cool conversations with people, you're enjoying your interactions, you're being really chill, laid back and taking more of the mindset, not I need to sell this person, but rather I'd like to, to get service. I see the value. It doesn't really make a huge difference to me whether they buy it because somebody, somebody will. Uh, so I'm just gonna go out there every day, do my thing and just really try to keep it super chill, transparent, open, honest, friendly, uh, and just a general feel of, you know, good vibes out there. And I feel like you do that and you just kind of don't pretend to be someone you're not. People pick up on that. It's like dogs yeah. in fear. People smell it. Yeah. If you just reek of desperation, like nobody wants to deal with you, right? No. Yeah. And I think people have a pretty good radar for like how authentic and genuine you are. Mm -hmm. I think that makes like a really big difference. It's one thing that I've really uh, emphasized and, you know, tried to embody this season is just being myself. People can realize, like they can pick up on whether you're being real or not. Um, and I think it makes a really big difference as to like what they feel when you're on the doors. Mm -hmm. But I think also for yourself, like, if you're going to do eight hours a day of this, why not just be yourself? Like there's no point in forcing and faking a persona that you don't actually, you know, embody. Um, it's just going to be much more enjoyable and like durable if you're just going to be yourself out there. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, as rookies, obviously we want to learn like the service. We want to learn a bunch of one-liners and like cool ways to say things, cool way to handle different objections. Yeah. Um, and obviously like that can be important at, at first. Uh, but I think sometimes we fall into the loop and I'm, I'm the exact same as like, sometimes I'll just fall into the loop of, I'm just trying to like do all these like salesy little tricks and like trying to sound super smooth and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Whereas sometimes you just have to take a step back and just slow it down, just make it super normal. Like I'll have days where like, I might not be having the best day and I'll tell myself, I'm like, okay, like this person, this door right here, I'm not even going to try and sell them. And I would encourage like people try this if, whether you're in a rut or you're having a bad day or whatever. Like I've had times where like, I'm just going to be like, okay, I'm going to go up to this door. I'm not even going to try and sell this person. And it's resulted in many sales for me. Yeah, I've had tons of sales where I've been like, okay, this person, like I might sell them, but honestly, I'm, I'm not even going to try and sell them. I'm just going to try and speak to them. Obviously, like I'm, I'm here to provide a service that like other neighbors are, you know, getting, um, but I'm not even going to try and sell them. I feel like sometimes we try too hard to, you know, convince and like force people and, and, you know, make them fall into your way of, of getting to sale. But I think it makes a big difference if you're just being genuine and you're not, you know, forcing them into, into selling or into buying the service. Yeah. It's definitely not a, a good approach to the future. You see, I have a bunch of cancels, people have buyer's remorse, but if we take a genuine interest and, um, you know, we try to customize the service to what they need and what they value, um, everyone walks away so much more happy, right? 
Yeah. So no, well, like uh, Lenny Gray talks about it in Door to Door Millionaire. It's you really just have to be a messenger of good news, right? So you're out there. Uh, you're selling something of fantastic value, a great service. Um, two of the five, so I have five personal commandments that are on my lock screen. I would show my phone right now, but I don't know what messages I have on there. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. Uh, but yeah, number one literally is be yourself. So I love that we're talking about that. It's so freaking important. Um, now, if your true personality is a more laid back person, then you need to have a more laid back selling style. Um, if you're a bit more, you know, excited and energy driven, which is my selling self, do that. And then people buy from people they like, mm -hmm. right? So really focusing more on not selling the person, but detaching yourself from the outcome, as you spoke about, I'm um, just being the messenger of good news, right? So it's like you're out there you're providing a service of great value for, you know, a discount, right? Because everyone's getting service at the same time. And you're going to be surprised at how many more people are going to start to listen to you when you go out there and you don't feel like you want to make that sale because people can sense the wolf at the door, yeah, right? So people are going to start to listen to you. Um, yeah, so be yourself is number one. Number two, you started to touch on it there, Juice, is just keeping it simple, right? So what happens in this job is, you know, one month, two months in, a lot of rookies, they have all this information that they're getting, right? And the correlations that we run and all these things. It's really, really easy to just overcomplicate stuff and to use the one-liners and to come off salesy. And, you know, the sales cycle is incredibly important. Don't get me wrong, but a lot of the sales I make, I literally just tell them how it is. And it's just, I'm being myself, I'm building rapport. And then, you know, I'm going to hit them with my go-to clothes, which is like, look, guys, give us a chance for the year. I love so that. my go-to clothes, have it's worth so much. This is a shot. Yeah. Just give us a shot. Yeah. Just give it a shot. I started, it's like my first year starting to use that one and it's absolutely money. So, and it's now like, it's tough. I feel like when you say that for rookies, because one thing that like, you'll, you'll know if you're a rookie and you've done this job is if you just go out to say, Hey, what do you think about this? You know, you, you make it like this often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be a no because you, yeah. you put pressure on it. Yeah. But really just like what you were both saying and just realizing that you can't trick people into buying, mm -hmm. right? Not only is that just not like ethical, but it just isn't realistic. People are smart. People are aware of sales tactics, right? A lot of rookies think like, oh, all I have to do is master this close. And I get learn these one liners and it's just all going to come together. Mm -hmm. But you're, as you get better at this job and you do it more, you realize there isn't like a magic recipe. There isn't just words you say. It's about knowing your service, being knowledgeable, but you know, maybe this sounds harsh. You just kind of use your brain. You got to turn actually this yeah, yeah. your brain on such your ear to open your ears yeah. and just listen to people talk to them and be upright. Like, look, like, honestly, you don't have to get this. It doesn't make a huge difference to me, uh, but it just makes sense for your house. It's why I'm working with, you know, neighbor A, B and C. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is pretty cool. Uh, they're giving me a shock and then go into your service. Mm -hmm. But when you do that, it just takes so much pressure off, I find, because like anyone listening to this now, ask your parents, what do they do when a door to door person comes to their door? They don't answer the door. They try to get them off the doorstep yeah. as quick as they can. And it's not because they actually are rejecting what they're selling. They're rejecting the idea of it, mm -hmm. the salesperson. And that's because salespeople are associated with all these slimy tactics. Mm -hmm. But if you're just out there and you know how to talk to people, to listen to people, genuinely try to find a deal and a value that would be beneficial for this person and just be super detached, you lower that guard and you just allow them to listen to you. And, and the majority of reasonable people will be like, you know what? That is a pretty good deal. Bugs do suck. Yeah, let's do yeah. this. Yeah. Nobody likes having bugs. No, bugs suck. <laughs> I think also like we sometimes get stuck in like wanting to give the perfect presentation and like want to hit all these different points and, you know, present it in such a cool way and like energetic. And, um, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll go to a door, you give a perfect presentation, you know, you have so much energy into it. You talk about all the different scopes of the services, you hit all your closes perfectly. And then they're like, oh, I think we're just going to pass. And you cycle a bunch of times. And they're like, oh, man, like I, I just did like a perfect presentation. Like, why didn't this guy buy? You move on to the next door. You do the same thing. Perfect presentation. Lights out. Yeah. He doesn't buy. You move on. You do that like five, ten times in a row. And you're like, geez, like what's going on? Like no one wants to buy. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's something that's like sustainable. Obviously, you want to do a, a good presentation every time. And you want your first impression because for every person that you talk to, you're you know, your conversation with them is the only first impression you're going to get. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess like for you, you know, I don't think it's sustainable to like try and like sell everyone super hard. You're, you're just going to end up burning out. Mm -hmm. So if like Jack said, you just take the pressure off the sale. Um, it just makes it a lot easier for you and that it comes off as less desperate. Yeah. People are just going to be more willing to buy. The customer yeah. doesn't want the perfect presentation either. Like they didn't sign up to be on Dragon's Den when they opened the door, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like you don't need some formal pitch, right? Like people want the reasonable person that's going to have a nice conversation with them. And ah, it just takes so much pressure off everyone. And then you can finally 
start to have a connection. Yeah. One one thing I'll say too, uh, Jack, you touched on is turning your brain on. Uh, I've been saying it in my rookies, Samo came, I think, or Samo or Kevin in our correlation, they said it, is when you're walking up to a door, uh, we all do this, top performers all do this, and you know, rookies sometimes get, you know, one, two rejections, couple no homes in a row, and they start to just go into the canned scripted sales pitch, and you're not gonna sell anyone like that. You really have to actively, you know, the input that you do, yes, it's the amount of doors that you knock, yes, it's the amount of hours you spend there, but it's the amount of hours that you spend actively turning your brain on working hard to sell people, yeah. right? And that extent, not working hard to sell people, but uh, essentially, yeah, you got to turn your brain on. You got to look around the house when you're walking up. Is there open weeping holes? Do you guys see active spider nests? Um, knowing if there's a conducive condition behind them, a river, whatever it might be. If they had a sign on their lawn that they're already with mosquito buzz, pay mosquito buzz. <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever it might be, all these different things, I know them going into it. I'm already on Google Maps looking if they have a deck, if they have a pool, whatever it might be. These little advantages I have on you know, all the other rooks, rookies, reps in the company. And it's the little things that, you know, there's no secret sauce. There's no magic words that me, Juice, Jack are saying over here. It really is. That is one of the little things that I focus on this year. And I think it's made the world of a difference for my numbers is literally just when I'm selling, I am out there and I'm trying my absolute best and I'm turning my brain on. Yeah, and you can be awake, right? So, yeah, and yeah, every single person's gonna have a different set of values, what makes sense to them. And so many presentations are lost sitting in the backyard with an interested person but we're talking about the wrong stuff. We're talking about stuff they don't value. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to how has your pitch changed from your first year to now? Okay. So similar idea. Maybe you're really salesy in your first year. Maybe you just had a god awful pitch. I don't know. Yeah. Mine was, I always tried to do the perfect presentation, like you were saying. And it was like, I was going to close once and that was going to be the deal. And it worked okay. But um, again, not sustainable, right? You're not going to win lots of deals like that. Mm -hmm. So how was your pitch? This is... You know, sort of going off what I was just saying, but I, I feel like in my first year, I was really trying to, you know, I'll, I'll backtrack. Have you guys seen the movie Kung Fu Panda? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. Okay. This is good. That's not the point. I promise. Okay. So if you've seen it, you know, at the end, the whole time he's wondering like, what's the, you know, the Dragon Warrior scroll? What's the secret, you know, the wushu finger? Bowl. Yeah. What's the rest <laughs> of you know, the, the secret formula for yeah. his dad's soup? And you realize there is nothing. It's just the soup itself, or it's there's no secret being Dragon Warrior. It's just because you believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of rookies are always looking for like, what's that secret soup formula? What's that one liner? What's that one word I can say when I say an objection that's going to work, right? And what's really changed for me is, like I said, moving away just from the really strict, rigid morning or afternoon closes, the very classic kind of typed out, scripted objection handles, like still using those, still piecing them together and use them throughout your pitch, but really just one, using my brain more, two, being super chill, super transparent, really just trying to have a good time out there, you know, have fun. Um, you know, my goal is always out there, like even if I can't sell that person, I wanna leave with them at least in a better mood. Yeah, you know, the interaction had like a positive wear off on them. <laughs> so I feel like really just being straight up to people, being like, look, you know what, like I'll be honest with you, I'm not out here to give up flyers, my job is, to fill up the routes for all we're already here. Yeah. You can call in anytime you want. We'll take great care of you. And it's a great service. You'll love it. But honestly, like the house does benefit from it. I'm already out here. I want to just get this done. And just like, look, I'll throw an extra 20 bucks off for you. And at that point, when you're just so reasonable, you're just shooting super straight. They're like, you know what? This guy isn't a salesman. It's not unreasonable what he's saying. It's not an unreasonable price. And yet we do get bugs. Mm -hmm. And way more people are going to give you that shot. And I feel like that's a big thing is just being super open, super conversational, just treating people like people, not like a, a big dollar sign, right? Just treating them like people and actually talking to them and having fun out there. And I feel like that just has made the world's difference as I've, you know, progressed with the job. Yeah. Uh, but that to be said, of course, not to negate the importance of training and practicing and getting those one-liners because when you do get good at knowing like a general way of handling certain objections certain concerns certain just like clean little one-liners that you can you know repeat throughout your pitch mm -hmm. uh, it does just you know come off as more professional and more well put together so yeah how you're perceived on the doors makes a huge difference too absolutely yeah and i think what you were saying there at the end like obviously part of the learning process is learning how to say things obviously learning the service how to communicate that so obviously you're going to go through the period where you have to actually learn how to say the, the, the service and say things, how to present your pitch. Uh, but once you overcome that, or once you get past like the, the basics, then you get to start focusing on other things like body language um, and like eye contact, tonality, all this kind of stuff. Um, so in terms of like, you were asking how has the, the pitch progressed, obviously, 
you get past the initial phase of learning the service, learning how to communicate that, uh, learning how to you know explain how it works in a way that they can understand it. Uh, then you start to focus on other things like tonality, which I think is a huge thing. It's one thing that has changed a lot for me. Uh, I talked about it in my Vantage Weekly, but I think having a tonality that's super relaxed, super chill. I'm never forcing words or fo forcing my tonality. I'm trying to sound super salesy or whatever it is. Just talking like how I would normally talk to people. Mm -hmm. And I always encourage people to try this exercise. Is sometimes I'll be doing pitch practice with someone. Yeah. They're giving me this pitch and I'm like, okay, dude, like take a second, relax. Talk to me like you'd be talking to me like we're friends, right? Talk to me like you're just my friend. And then they'll do their pitch like they were just talking to my friends and it's a hundred times better. Yeah. I think it makes a really big difference. It's funny how you have the servers and they use the server voice, right? In sales, you have the sales voice. It's like that, mm -hmm. hey, how's it going? Hello, hello, right? And like, what the heck did I just do to my voice right there, right? It's yeah. purely just a sales resistance because people are going to hear that and be like, okay, who the heck is this guy? Um, I don't want to buy because that's exactly what they're thinking. So much your seller, exactly, yeah. right? And it's just instant. And no matter what you can say, unless you say the most magic words ever, they're not going to listen to you, right? So last year, that was probably the biggest thing that I struggled with um, was exactly that. You know, I was just I was using my server voice out there, and then what I did this year, same as Juice is saying, exactly how I speak to my friends, and it's difficult to do. It's really difficult when you're speaking to strangers to yeah. just really just focus on being yourself. Um, Lenny Gray, once again, I'll mention him again from Door Door Millionaire. He talks about being a seven out of 10, right? So it's, you know, the energy that you have, your personality, think of it on a scale of one to 10, right? 10 is you're super amped up. You're on five energy drinks. You're super outgoing, raw, raw. And then one is you're just the most uninteresting person in the world, right? He says, and I completely agree with you. I've been doing it this year is you need to be a seven, right? Mm -hmm. um, now still be yourself while you're being that seven, but you can't be too raw rocks and people are going to want to listen to you. Can't be Goggins out there. Can't be Goggins. Oh. People, they're just going to be so overstimulated and are going to have to think about it. Um, whereas if you're a one, they're not going to want to talk to you, right? Everybody, and I think it was Kevin that came in and he gave the story about Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, he shows up to every single game when he was playing and he'd show up looking like a million bucks, wearing a suit. And, you know, an interviewer asked him why. It's because he said, and I completely do this by myself this, uh, this year as well, is everybody gets one Michael Jordan experience. Most of the time, people can only go to one Michael Jordan game because the tickets were so much. Yeah. When I'm at a door, I am giving everybody the one max parachute experience. And you know, damn right, I'm going to be the best version of myself out there, but I'm not going to be that 10. I'm going to tone it back a bit because I'm also trying to, you know, make some sales out there. And if you're 10, you're not going to make the sales, but making sure it's like it's energy transference. It's all energy transference, right? I, I feel good. The client feels good. The client buys when they feel good because they buy based on emotion. Yeah, I think that's my two cents on that. But yeah. yeah, and I, I want to touch back on like what you were saying with like the server voice. And it's funny because like we do sales and like we wonder like why are these people have so much resistance? Like, yeah, I understand like these sales people, but like I'm a good guy. Like why why don't they trust me? Mm -hmm. um, but like we face it as well. Like you walk into a store and someone's like, hey, like can I help you with something? You're just gonna be like, yeah, I'm just browsing. Yeah, like I'm just, I'm just looking around. Even if you had something in mind that you're looking for, and like right away, you're just gonna be like, yeah, not like I'm good. I'm just looking around. Um, so like I, sometimes you just kind of have to put yourself in their shoes. Um, but with what you were saying, I think one thing I've heard is that people don't buy when they understand. They they buy when they're understood. And I think this is a big, it's a big thing when you're selling a service. They're not gonna buy if they understand the service. Um, although like some people will, like the, the service makes sense and obviously you want to communicate it in a way that they understand it and that it's logical for the house. Um, but they'll buy when they feel understood. So that's why being genuine and, you know, creating a relationship with the customer, um, more of a conversation rather than a presentation, I think is huge. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, just to say it again, people buy when they, un when they feel understood rather than when they understand. Yeah. Yeah. It's that rapport, it's that connection. Exactly. I love it. All right, so next topic on the list here. Uh, so I guess we already covered indifference, so let's skip that. Let's go to the jump from zeros and ones up to those threes and fives. So what does it take to have the transformation that you said? I've seen it happen a few times where we have a rep who zeros, ones, zero, 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 one, you know, that kind of week, and then something just turns on a dime and they just figure it out. It's rare, but it happens. You guys are both examples of that, but in the off season. Yeah. So, so how, how does that transition occur? 
Yeah. So I remember like pretty, pretty vividly in my rookie year, my first two weeks, I did 14 days in a row without taking a break. I just came out the gate swinging and first day I got one sale. I have no idea how I literally told them we did mosquitoes when we didn't. I had to go back and correct it. I got the wrong payment information. I messed up like everything. <laughs> like, I think he just felt bad for me. Yeah. Got one, one the next day, zero the next day, two the next day, zero the next day. Like in my first two weeks, it was a lot of one zeros and twos. And I remember seeing other people in the company who do like three, fours and fives every day. I was thinking like, how the hell is that possible? Like these guys, like, like no one wants to buy pest control. This is crazy. But then I remember what really shifted for me was I was back home for a weekend and I sold near my own place. So I think I just felt a little more comfortable there. And I had a three day and then the next day I had a six day. And from there on, I just kind of went to a point where the rest of that month, I was consistently doing, you know, fives, fours, sixes, sevens, a couple, eight days, like just bigger numbers. And I think one of the biggest things is it's really a mindset shift when you're going from thinking every day, I just really hope I don't bagel. <laughs> I just like, I got to get out there, get my one so I don't bagel, yeah. right? That's your mindset versus I'm sure either of you will agree with this. You too, Mateo, I haven't done this for years. As an experience rep, when you've gone out there, you know what to expect. You know, you have the skills to do it, the confidence to go out there. It's like, I know I'm not going to bagel. It's not a matter of if I get sales, but just how many. Yeah. So just going out there and instead of thinking kind of the worst case, what you're trying to beat off, you're thinking about what's the absolute goal? What am I working towards? Yep. Yeah. And there was a cool little clip. And again, uh, I literally just saw this on like an Instagram reel for a te TED talk. But the guy was talking about how when it comes to feedback and how to structure your, your goals and what you're doing, when you think about air traffic controllers, they never say, don't go here, don't go here, you'll crash if you go here, don't do this. They say, hey, go here and you'll be good. And what the difference there is when you focus on the negative outcome, that's what your mind's focused on. And you're more likely to be drawn towards that in your subconscious actions, thoughts, and, and moreover. Yeah. Whereas when you do positive affirmations in terms of getting towards the goals, that's what you're going to be thinking about. So rather than going out and thinking, I just can't bagel, I can't bagel. All you're going to be thinking about is the possibility and existence of a bagel. Whereas yeah. you go out there and thinking, I got to get my five. I'm yeah. going to keep knocking my doors. I'm not going to go until I get my five. Mm -hmm. uh, and you actually are working towards that. It just puts everything in a more positive frame. So obviously it's not just a mindset shift. You have to put the work in, uh, reading sales books, watching podcasts, pitch, or pitch practicing, asking experienced reps for advice, polishing your pitch, getting the service knowledge, understand all these little things. But really it starts, I feel like with that mindset shift. And when you realize that you can go from not just hoping you get a sale that day, but this is something where consistently you can be making multiple sales every single day, regardless of the area. Like I know I do every day I go out there without, with a few exceptions, I'm going to get like at least three or four. Yeah. Doesn't matter when I start knocking or where I go. I know I'm going to get that just because you have enough experience. So that's possible. Yeah. It's like in your head, it's like, oh, it's Michael Jordan showing up to the game. Like, oh, I'm really cool if I don't lose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He needs to be like, oh, if I don't miss this free, yeah. I don't think he does. He's earnest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think also like what you were saying there, um, like doing the extra stuff, like reading podcasts, a lot of the advice that people will give you sounds like super cliche. Like if you ask anyone for advice, they'll just tell you like, oh, just work hard. Don't give up. And like you hear it so many times that at one point you almost like tune it on. You're like, okay, like everyone says that it almost doesn't have the same impact. Mm -hmm. uh, but truly like hard work makes the biggest difference. This is something that Jack says a lot um, is that the bageling is a choice. Like it's not just a, it might not just be a choice of like one, like one decision that you make that makes you bagel but it's a combination of a bunch of small little decisions uh, that, you know, lead or, you know, end up making you bageling, right? Whether that's, you know, what, what do I decide to eat this morning? What time do I wake up? Do I go to the gym or not? Um, do I like eat this snack right now? Do I take a five minute break? Five minute break leads into a 10, 15, 30 minute break. Do I knock this door? Oh, I don't really feel like knocking this door. Um, I kind of just want to skip this door. It's like these small decisions that lead up to you know, finishing up with a bagel. Um, so I think like Jack says, like bageling is really just a choice. Uh, but what you were saying there with like, you know, the, uh, the one day where you had three and then the next day you had six. And I think at that point you realize like, okay, this is what I can do. This is what's possible. Once you like do something and you realize what you're capable of doing, then you kind of realize, okay, I can do this. And you know, once you start doing it every day, then you're like, okay, this is what I'm able to do every day. Like there's no reason for me not to, to do this. Uh, but I completely w agree with what you're saying. I've had days where I literally, and it sounds super counterintuitive. It's almost like weird for me to admit this, but I've had days where I'm like, okay, like 
honestly, like if I bagel, that's fine. And it might not be good advice, but honestly, on those days where I've been like, if I bagel, like that's honestly, like, I don't really care. Uh, those have been some of my biggest days. I remember my, my 12th day, my PB that day, I was like, it was the second or third day of the, of the, of the season. I was like, honestly, like if I bagel, like doesn't really matter. And then I went out and sold 12 accounts that day. So mm-hmm. I think it, it goes back to the indifference, but you know, just if you went into a day, let's say you're out, you're out in the field and you had 30 sales. And we were talking about this earlier, right? If I'm, if I have like 30 sales, I have a bunch of sales in the day. I'm not going to go up to everyone just like trying to convince them to sell or convince them to buy. I'm just going to, you know, tell them what I'm doing. Like all the neighbors are doing this. Um, and not only is it going to result in more sales, but it's just going to be much better in terms of like your energy on the doors. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, just hard work is a huge thing. Um, like it sounds super cliche and people say it all the time, but I think hard work is really important. Um, and then like you were saying, once you realize what you're capable of doing, then there's no reason for you not to keep doing that. Yeah. So uh, every single person in this company has mm, that moment of realization, right? Mm, mm, sorry, that, whether it's uh, I'm, <laughs> it's a water. Um, every single person here is going to have either you know a four sale day, six sale day, twelve sale day, sixteen sale day, whatever it might be. Um, and there's a turning points, right? Even if you're you know a less performing rookie and you're making ones, you're making twos. Maybe it's a sale that you had to work super incredibly hard to do, and you're very proud of that one sale. And it shows you, you could do this job. <clears throat> Sorry. The reason that we're able to continue to perform at the level we are, and some people get their six sale day and then go back to zeros and ones and twos, it's easy to say, yeah, it's mentality, but how do they actively actually switch the mentality? It's purely input. Like that's exactly it, is once you prove to yourself that you're capable of doing what you can do, whether that's from a four sale day, whether it's a six sale day, whether it's the one really hard earned sale, you literally now have to shift your mentality, which is really difficult to do, but now you're aware that you're able to do these certain numbers. You just have to go out there and put in the input. That is the only difference, right? And so those, day, those days that I remember last season, like my biggest day, it was a nine sale day and that was at the end of May. And that clicked in my head. I'm like, okay, I now have a choice. I can now go and be the best version of myself and continue to do it. And that's strictly through input. And that's what I did, right? You know, you look at me, Juice Jack, the top performers here, um, Mateo, I'm sure in your time as well, when you were selling, it's like, it's purely a choice if you really want to go and have the confidence, because now you have the confidence, yeah. but you're not going to continue to put up the numbers if you don't put in the input. So it truly is one of those things is that you cannot let that high control you and you live in the high and you live off that one day. It's pretty funny how easy it is to do. You know, my 16th sale day, Juice, I'm curious after your 12th sale day, uh, I made two the day after my 16th, purely because I let that one moment live in my head the next day. Right. So it's, it's, I don't know. What did you do the next day after you did 12? I had three the next There we go. It's so easy to do, Jack. You're going to touch on that too. It's, it's, there's this one book and I know this was on the very first steps of this podcast, Kevin Taddeo's favorite book. He definitely talked about it, but winning by Tim S. Grover, who was the personal trainer of Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, Charles Oakley, Charles Barkley. Yeah. So like a pretty good list of guys he's worked with, you know, not bad. And he just really talks about how luck. It's so easy to get a win and get so bent up and impressed with yourself on that win. You know, it's been like, oh, I did this. That's so cool. I did this. And you just focus too much on how impressed you are with that achievement rather than just thinking, okay, you know, even if you're the top rep in the country or the bottom one, you both start at zero at the start of the day. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and just realizing that it's not about, like, it's cool to have big days, but just realizing every single day, just like you're clocking out a nine to five, you put your hours in every single day. You got to put the inputs in, you got to put the hours in, you got to put the work in. And every single day you start at zero. Yeah. Every day is a bagel until you decide to hit your goal. Yep. Right? Sure. Yeah. So let's shift uh, gears here. Let's talk a little bit about books, learning, all that jazz. So I, I just finished reading Skin in the Game uh, by Nassim Tulab. Awesome book. Um, and one of the things he points out is that when you have skin in the game, uh, the things that would otherwise just be horribly boring, like just want to pull your hair out boring, like reading some of these books, right? Become immensely interesting and easy to understand. Um, and, and that's what kind of got me into a lot of the reading I do now was just like sales books. It's like, I want to get an edge on everyone else. And so I'm just going to like crush all these books. Um, and so I would encourage people to start reading stuff that's relevant to what they're doing in the field. So when you have skin in the game, uh, and there's some reward down the road to actually studying this material and absorbing it, um, then that's when it starts to get really fun to learn this stuff. Have you guys found any of that too? Have you found hundred percent? Yeah. Like it's, it's one of those things where I get that it's tough, but it also doesn't really make sense to me. 
where this is a job that when you're on commission, right, it's uncapped, you can literally make as much as you're worth. And it just seems so obvious that like the more inputs you do, the more training you do, the more books you read, even if it's only a slight percent, it will make you better, which will result in more sales and will result in more money. And there's no cap on that. Just the more you do, the more you're going to make. It's just a mm -hmm. fact that yeah. you put the hours in. So yeah, like the one of the biggest ones for me uh, in this job has been my rookie year, Samo, uh, you know, current rookie holder out here is my manager my rookie year, uh, got me on how to win friends and influence people, oh, yeah. which is just phenomenal book. Like even if you're not in sales, it's just very effective. Um, Door to Door Millionaire is great. Uh, I really like uh, oh, winning, like I said, as well as a really good one. Any other like uh, mediums you get your stuff through, like YouTube or podcasts or whatnot? You know, this is a book that really has nothing to do with sales. I listened to the audio book and I really enjoyed it. And it was the math. Actually, oh, it's right there. Green lights, the Matthew McConaughey. Book. Oh yeah. yeah. I listened to an audio book because he narrates it and he's just such a cool dude to listen. He's so stupid. <laughs> and just like, I love my Lincolns. I just drive them. Like it's like, so sick. Uh, and I like it because it's a lot of cool things where it's not salesy, but it just kind of gets you to think about, all right, like. Be Matthew McConaughey out there. I genuinely try to do my best Matthew McConaughey impression, just being super chill, laid back, and genuine. Mm -hmm. uh, so I find it's not even just sales books, but anything that you think is helpful for mindset and perspective. Uh, this Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck is a great one. Yeah. Um, there's a couple other good ones I read this. Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits is phenomenal. Yeah. That's good. Uh, Leaders Eat Last I read this year right. as well, which is a really good one. Just any books I find that kind of give you a different insight on on the way your own mind works on your what your actions affected mm -hmm. big thing for me i think that i've i've learned to draw parallels between as you guys know i was a philosophy major for school i uh, love philosophy love reading it and learning about it and i find there's a lot of lessons from that that are applicable to you know not just your personal life but to sales or whatever you do mm -hmm. uh so i think yeah really just any way you can feed the brain and mind with different outlets different mm -hmm. perspectives is all going to add up and compound towards a more beneficial and light yeah. perspective. I actually talked about callousing the mind. Oh yeah. There we go. Yeah. So I'll touch on that too. It's in, I mean, I'll tie that into reading. Uh, I hate reading. I test it. Um, I didn't read much in school. Like we had, you know, spark notes and I run, yeah, spark notes. Uh, I don't like reading. I used to like reading actually when I was like eight years old, but, um, this off season, I read atomic habits by James clear. I read, uh, how to win friends and influence people with Dale Carnegie. Um, you know, a door door millionaire. So I read three different books and for me, it was literally just callousing my mind, right? So when you guys work out, you callous, you know, the, the hands or whatever it is, but, um, shout out Noah Vague, Edmonton manager partner there with, uh, with Insight and Vantage. Um, he said it in the Montreal manager conference and I, I love it. It literally is one of the, the main things that, you know, I, I thought about in the off season is you really have to callous this, uh, cause you can callous your body. Right. And one of the ways of callousing your mind is going to the gym because, you know, going to the gym sucks and it hurts and it's hard. Um, but, you know, you get energy from it. You feel good. You look good. All these things. Um, so it's so important. Uh, now, callousing the mind, you know, in the season itself is tough to do. The idea of callousing your mind, if you guys come back, when you guys come back next year, um, is essentially you want to do the hard things at the beginning in the off season so that when the season gets there and it's hard knocking doors, but it's raining and the goddamn tornado. Um, and you really don't want to go and do this difficult job. You've already done so many difficult things in the off season that your brain is ready for it, right? So I'm um, reading these books for me. Um, I hated it, but I knew first of all, yes, you know, I would you know, develop my brain and it would be something really good, tangible stuff for my habits, my sales skills, um, but also for my brain, right? So you now go to the gym. Uh, I know No Vague does uh, cold plunges. I try to do cold showers and I hated every second of it, but you know, I tried. Um, all these different things, reading books, um, going on walks, things that I didn't want to do, but I did them because I knew in this job, fuck, I mean, Juice, Jack, Mateo, how many times you just not want to knock, right? So many times. Yeah. But the little things when you're callousing your mind, it pushes you through, right? And that's, yeah. even just like extracting the hesitation out of it. It's like, yeah, it full ups territory. I'm going to get out of my car and go hard attack the first door. Right? Hard <laughs> door is the car door. Yeah. Yeah. And to just add on that, like, I, I love the callous in your mind. And I think, it's useful for, you know, rookies and this job specifically. But I also just feel like it's a really applicable life lesson in general. Yeah. A motto I hear circulate around this company all the time is do easy things if you want a hard life, do hard things if you want an easy life. Yeah. And it's just like, if you never push yourself out of your comfort zone, you're never going to find out what you can do. If you really think about it, pretty much every great invention, every great accomplishment, most incredibly successful and innovative individuals 
have done so when they've been pushed past comfort. They've lost job. They've gone broke. They've had tragedy happen. That's something happened. And not to say that you necessarily want to go through tough times, but if you're always taking the easy route, you're never really pushing yourself and there's not going to be any growth. Like if you're only ever lifting weights that are super easy for you, there's not going to be any growth. You have to really push yourself, feel the pain, tear that muscle to actually see growth. And I feel like with this job, it's just such a good outlet to do probably one of the hardest jobs there is. Yeah. And if you can do it, then it just really opens up what you're capable of doing. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I really do believe that people will live their life at some average level of like anxiety and stress. And that's going to be the same basically regardless of what you do. Like if you take some CEO level individual that's handling, you know, million dollar deals and all that and their stress and their anxiety, I feel like they would get the same stress and anxiety from like my Uber's not showing up on time or, you know, there's a snowstorm outside um, if they were just doing nothing and hanging out at home, right? And it, it's all relative, right? So it takes some time to callous your mind and to get to that level. But there's only so much stress and anxiety that you're going to experience. And if you become used to it and you become comfortable in that position, um, then there's, you can do so much more stuff. So that's really for me, but at least what, uh, yeah, I think what one quote that I like as well is, um, sacrifice temporary, pre temporary pleasure for long-term stability. And I think that's a theme that's pretty important. This, like we're, we're sacrificing a summer of hard work, which a lot of people aren't willing to do. They're just going to stay at home and you know, work a, a wage job, which is fine. But, you know, for the people like us who, you know, aren't set out for like a, I guess, regular life that we just want to be above average. We want to be great. It's like you, you have to sacrifice certain things such as, like I said, temporary pleasure, like hanging out on, on weekends, although like I'll still do that. And, you know, being away from family during a summer, which is a huge thing, right? Like we all live on our own. We could, you know, stay at home and, and be with our family during the summer, but it's one of those things that we sacrifice. Um, and so that's one of the things that like, especially right now we're young, it's like, you know, if you sacrifice the summer to really just like work hard, then, you know, it's, it's, you sacrifice temporary pleasure for something that's much more valuable in my opinion, long term. And it, it's crazy what that actually, like what windows start to open up when you do that. Mm -hmm. Cause sure. Like anyone who's done this job as a manager, all four of us, those are going to attest to this zero life. Like right now, like social life, dating life, free time, just nothing. Yeah. It's literally just wake up, eat, working all day, get the gym if I'm lucky and go, you know, get home in time for a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. And it's brutal, but I have to do that for maybe four months of the year. And in those four months, I make what a lot of people with more comfort would over 12 months or so. Yeah. And then that just gives you the rest of the year to literally do what you want. So mm -hmm. like last, this last year, I had the privilege of going for two months in Southeast Asia traveling with a bunch of other guys from this company. You know, there's a lot of other people who travel or take that money and use it for investments or use that free time to spend more time with their family or do school or whatever. But when you're able to just really concentrate and dedicate yourself to a singular goal and go through that grind, mm -hmm. not only does it free up so much for you, not only does it really callous the mind and prepare you for other stuff, but it just makes the break feel so much better. Like, yeah. is there anything that's better than cracking a beer on a beach or a dock at a cottage after grinding it out for a summer? Yeah, no. The best goddamn beer of your life. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, one thing I'll touch on quick, Mateo, before you switch subjects here, on callousing the mind. Um, you know, I spoke about in the off season, how you callous your mind to prepare yourself for the season, uh, but you flip it, right? So it's in the season, if you're a rookie and you're just doing this to learn sales, you know, just to get the skill set, if you're not going to do door to door next year, whatever it might be, is when it's raining outside, when you're getting 17 rejections in a row, when you're getting 50 no homes in a row, all these separate things that are very tough to deal with in tough situations that you're in, um, you're going to callous your mind, right? And so what's funny is like all these, you know, adverse situations that it's, it's tough, right? This job is, we keep saying it, literally one of the toughest jobs you can do. Mm -hmm. And as a rookie, as an experienced rep is during the season, when you're able to push through all the tough times, and you're callousing your mind and you push through and you make a sale on that day that was tough. You made two sales on the day that was tough. Imagine yourself at the end of this summer, whatever you do in your social life, you know, with your family, with your future jobs, whatever it might be, is you just grinded it out for four months. And I mean, everyone can attest to this. How much you learn in this four months is equivalent to an entire degree of a bachelor's degree and five years of work experience at a cushy desk job. You really are callousing your mind every single day that you're working this job and it's developing yourself for the future, right? So it's not even just callousing your mind to prepare yourself for this job. It's this job literally calluses your mind for the future that you have as well. You know, I, I actually like, I'm curious when you bring that up. Yeah. So like, how would you guys say, because all of us have done this job for more than a year at this point, 
And I think I, we'd all agree it's a really valuable experience. Like, what are some specific examples of things you've like noticed change in your life and your abilities, your skills that like you feel like have gotten better from this job? I feel like it's just like, it ain't that bad. <laughs> like just that, <laughs> yeah. that like saying of, and because like, everything's relative, right? And, and like you said, it's about callous in the mind. I do go back to Goggins, whenever you say that, yep. David Goggins, and he has the idea of like the cookie jar. Yep. Um, and every time you do something hard, you put a cookie in the jar. I think yeah. he says it. Some of them. Might be the, the opposite. Anyways, the idea is that like whenever something hard pops up, you can go back in time and be like, oh, I did this other thing that was way harder. And this is a piece of cake compared to that. Yeah. Right. And yeah, some of the darkest moments have been like on the doors or, well, not on the door, but sitting in my car being like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, only, only, and yeah, you just soldier on, you get through it. Um, and it's so incredibly rewarding um, just down the road. And so specifically, I don't know if, like, it, it's funny, a lot of reps will go back to school after and then they'll be like, all my friends say I'm different yep. now, right? And I'm sure that manifests itself in confidence and how outgoing you are and whatnot. Uh, but it's just like, it's the intangibles. Yeah. 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 One thing that like, I think is like pretty obvious is like, just like presenting in general, like after my rookie year, like this school year that just passed by, just doing like presentations in class, like it was just something that I enjoyed. Um, it was just like, okay, like I'm not, dude, I'm not scared to present in front of my class. Like it's something that I actually look, look forward to now. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are like nervous or like anxious to do those kind of things. Uh, but like after doing this, it's like, dude, I went up to random people's doors trying to sell them a, ser a service that they weren't thinking of yeah. before I came here. What, like, what is a presentation in front of a bunch of people that I already know about a subject that we're already learning about? Yeah. Um, so just like stuff like that, it, it just makes it more enjoyable just conversations and like interactions with people in general. Like now I'll, I'll walk in a grocery store, I'll see a random person be like, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Good. You know, like you talk to like regular people and you just have like cool conversations with them and like people that you would never talk to, like someone on like the bus, for example, someone who like, if you didn't do this or like a couple of years ago, you probably would have never talked to. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, you could be on the bus or you could be on the subway or you're, you know, you're doing something. You end up having like a conversation about this person and you find out that he's like a, you know, he's like a doctor from like Germany and he's like all these cool things about like a human that you probably would have never talked to in the first place. Um, so it obviously makes you a lot more outgoing. You can have like more interactions, you're more chill and like more comfortable in social settings. I think that that's a huge benefit. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest thing for me has just been confidence. Um, for anybody that's known me before I've done this job, I would say I never lacked confidence in certain aspects, but the biggest form of confidence I've gained from this is professional confidence. Um, so after, you know, literally banging on doors with a binder and generating, you know, 200 plus thousand dollars of revenue, I now know with utter confidence and, so, you know, like this is going to happen is I'm going to be successful, right? So it's one of those things that whether you come in the summer and you make 20K in commission, you make 50K in commission, you make 10K in commission, if you're able to do such a tough job, the confidence that you gain professionally, knowing that you're going to be okay, because, you know, these are 20 years old, 21 years old, 22 year old people is the time of uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen after you graduate from school. You don't know what sector you want to enter in, in business or in other, you know, areas of life. And one thing that, you know, is really, really calming for me is knowing that no matter what I do, um, whether it's sales, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's door to door, whatever I'm going to do, I know that I now have a skill set that I'm going to be okay no matter what happens. And I think the peace of knowing that has given me so much confidence also in other aspects of my life. Yeah. Right. So I think for me, it's just been the biggest uh, confidence booster, I would say. Yes, sir. Well, we do have to cut it off here because we're getting to the hour mark, but I'll end on an example that I think kind of underscores the, how everything's relative and how we should callous our mind in that. Uh, so we had a sales rep who's a good friend of mine, um, came for summer, average rep sort of thing, right? Next year, he goes into a tech sales company and they tell the batch of rookies they just brought in, they're like, hey, you guys have to make 60 cold calls a day. And it's like, he said he's on the call and, and people are like, this is impossible. Like people are just like, they're ready to quit. They're like, what did I get myself into? And he's sitting there. He's in his office that he gets like a five hundred dollar uh, like health <laughs> check to go and buy like a new office chair and stuff. It's air conditioned, and and he just gets to sit at a desk and pick up a phone, right? And sixty, we talk to way more than sixty yeah. people. Yeah, we pound on a hundred doors a day or more, right? And so just for him, he's like, this is so easy, and just shattering the um, expectations for for what a rookie person would do in that company. And it's just because everything's relative. And if you hadn't had the door-to-door -door experience, still a smart guy, still charismatic, et cetera, um, 
he just would have had different priors and it wouldn't have had the same result. It sets, it sets you up. That's exactly what it sets you up. Yeah, That's such a good point. Cause like really what both of you are saying is the professional confidence you get from this job. Cause genuinely, if you really think about it, you're spending eight hours a day, six days a week talking to complete strangers who are not at all expecting you or thinking about what you're, the service you're selling is. And after meeting them out of the blue, they don't know you or trust you. Being an effective communicator, hearing them out, finding a solution that helps them out, getting them to trust you and creating that sale out of thin air. Mm -hmm. Like companies recognize that. People recognize that. Business and with rec people, I might add, that are might be high powered individuals in industry. Yeah. You know, it might be some head of capital markets or whatnot. You're talking, you're knocking on a house that's multi million dollars, right? It's a mortgage payment that's yeah. $10,000 a month. So you talk to some high level people. It's, it's the kind of thing where at this point, like having done this job, I truly believe every young person should do this job at least one summer. I know when I'm a dad and I have kids, I'm mandatory making them come out and outdoors for a minimum one summer. Because mm -hmm. uh, when you've done it, not only do you get like a skill set, but you just, sales is, a, is an industry that can never go out because businesses thrive and depend on it. And if you have that in your back pocket, you will always be a marketable professional individual in the business world. Yeah. You will always have a potential opportunity for a job. You'll never have, you could like any one of us in this room, you could take every dollar we've ever made, put us at zero. And after the summer, you could be at least survive. You could have money for food, rent, and still work your way back. Yes, sir. It just makes it too easy. I love it. And so on that note, I think we wrap it up. We could talk here for hours, but uh, we got a candidate party to get to. Oh, let's go. Thanks for joining guys. And uh, thank you all for listening.